I went from having, you know, all of the infrastructure in the entire world from like simple shit, like a healthcare plan that functioned. The crazier the idea, the better. That is kind of the mantra. I say, if it's not making people's lives better or more fun, I'm not investing in it. We invested when it was an idea and it was 25 pages of a PowerPoint and a two hour phone call. That was about three years ago. And today that business is worth a billion and a half dollars. Every job is just a sales job. Every job is just a sales job. You're selling something to somebody. Hi, my name is Jason Rasnick, the CEO of Benzinga, and welcome to the Raz Report. As always, before we kick things off, I want to quickly tell you about what Benzinga is. Before I started Benzinga in 2010, there were very few places to get real-time information on financial markets. I thought it was unfair that Wall Street had access to this information before the average Joe investor. So I created Benzinga to level the playing field for you, the retail investor. Benzinga is for the people and by the people. Now let's dive into the show. Founder of Animal Capital, venture capitalist, the man, the myth, the legend, one of the most networked guys in the industry has made some startup investments that have, I don't know, I feel like 50X or, I mean, these are just some crazy ones, but we're going to get into that. We're going to learn how he's done it, how he's built such a freaking crazy network. I guess I'll say fucking network. But Marshall, welcome to the show. Jason, thank you for having me. I, I, I do feel like every time we talk, whether it's on the phone or like in your car, I feel like we're recording a podcast. So this, this just kind of feels like an extension. Good, good, good. That's the way I want it to be. So where you're comfortable and we can talk, whatever. And, you know, let's see if, if this, but we may need Aaron to come in and fix things when he screws stuff up. So, right, Aaron? All right, good. But so that's the only difference. So Marshall Sandman you last name by the way how'd you the, the, like your grandfather great grandfather i asked you that before i mean same same I'm, i think i'm i think i'm like six generations deep sand like we we don't have like a crazy coming over to okay. Ellis island name change story i'm like sandbird we Bird. were totally a melting pot like eastern european russian jewish ashkenazi jewish family okay um, and it's been great all right. All right. So now I want to get to your early days. You're 10 years old. What was Marshall doing? Oh my God. Um, talk about early days. I know, most of my like formative, formative years, I was like Mr. Musical theater. Um, which really? Actually, oh yeah. From going to like, see like Ryan singing King. or what? Oh yeah. Singing, acting, a little bit of dancing. Um, I, I really thought that's what I was going to do. I mean, not only in middle school, I mean, middle school, my time out of school was literally either basketball um, or musical theater. I fully, my, I took my inspiration from high school musical, anything that Troy Bolton wanted to do. So just, just singing in basketball and trying, trying to make it from rehearsal to basketball practice. All right. So that, I didn't know about this whole, the young, the younger days. So you're into music, into theater, then you got into networking. Your parents helped you get into networking, like meeting people. How did they help you get into that? Is that what theater did for you? I don't know. When, since I was like eight years old and I was capable of doing this, my my dad. Uh, capable of doing this. What's this? Music? Oh. Networking? Networking. Since yeah. I was cap capable of like going and speaking to people on my own physically, walking and talking and remembering people's names. Um. My dad is pretty much incapable and I love him. He's a spectacular human being and a great dad. He doesn't remember anyone's name. Like my friend's names, girlfriend's names, second cousin's names out the window. And so I got very used to it at an early age going up to whoever my dad was talking to as like a rule of my household. And I'd say, hey, I'm Marshall. And even if I knew what their name was, I would force them to say their name in front of my dad so that my dad didn't have to act like he didn't know. I love and you. So I, I, I've been, I, that was a, a, a habit I formed 23 years ago. And I still do that to this day. I love Just, you. You don't understand. I love you. Listen to this. I, I have like, I, you would probably say I network decently. I'm terrible with names. And even like, it's not even names. It's recognizing someone. I had this kid. I was flag football and this mom's like, Oh, I see her at the thing. She's like, where are the kids? I'm like, how do we know? Like, and then I figured it out. But you saying the name every time, I mean, that's powerful. And so that's what you've learned and you picked up. So you're so to, to remember the names, are you doing like Marshall uh, Monster, Montana, like, uh, you know, uh, Alley Alligator? Jason, it's my only it's my it's my only superpower. 
It's my only superpower is remembering names and faces. Every, do- everything else is like a learned thing from Goldman or from school or from my parents or, or you know, whatever. The only, I think, like true God-given talent I have is I remember people's names and faces. That's fucking unreal. That is a superpower that you have no idea. So if someone said, Jason, you, if you could pay a million dollars right now, a hundred thousand a year for the next 10 years to do, to have that superpower or even have 70% of it, I would do it in a heartbeat. That is my biggest freaking weakness in life. Like it, it cause it, it, it's such an advantage, Marshall. You stand up like, Oh my God, this guy remembered me. It's such an advantage. I'm like, I want to put Google glass in my eyes or have everyone wear a name tag. Um, like that's the, that's amazing, dude. Now I know how you did it. Now I know how you networked. You just have, you just know names. That's it. That's it. It's it's that easy. The most, the most important thing I think for me now is when you're talking to a Paris or Wahlberg or or whomever that I've been super blessed to get to spend time with the, when you remember like, you know, the assistant's name or the chef's name or like, oh, I actually met this person in line at Starbucks and they said that they, we're in the mail room for you a hundred years ago. And you remember that person's name, being able to relate that back and show that you cared about it goes a really long way with every, it goes a long way with Nate. Yeah. It goes along with everybody. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to move forward from music, your networking, but then you, where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to Cornell. Um, I it was the best school I could get into. I mean, I, I, I uh, love my parents, but needed to get away from home. Um, and I think otherwise I probably would have, I'm from Raleigh, so I probably would have gone to Duke if I was going to stick around. Um, and so I spent, mo- I spent most of my high school career washing dishes and line cooking at a restaurant called the Angus Barn near Duke. Um, just, I mean, not just so, but kind of just so that I could have it on my resume because at the hotel school, really the only way to get in is to have like a really distinct, like true hospitality spend. Cause my grades were good. My extracurriculars were good, but I was not curing cancer. I needed to do something special. And so I was literally going from school to basketball practice or cross country practice to theater rehearsal. And then I would get to the restaurant at eight, nine, 10 PM and stay till three 30 or four in the morning, washing dishes um, and getting the kitchen prep for the next morning. And I did that most nights of the week. All right, so now we're going to go, because I know we have a special surprise guest coming on in a little bit, um, you know, so we'll, we'll get to that. But then you go, you're in Cornell, you go to Goldman Sachs? Yeah, right out of school. Nice. What would you go in as? What role? Like, you, what were you doing there? I was structuring equity derivatives. Um, fuck it. What the f- uh, shut up. What the fuck is that? Okay. I get it. But you know, equity derivatives, that word derivatives, like most people can't spell it. I think I D E R I V A T I V E S. See, I got yeah. it, but well, I know, but it's, it's a lot of letters. Um, so what limit. that means is we had hedge fund clients that wanted to get exposure, not just to individual stocks, which is buying equities or just buying stock. They wanted exposure to like, a whole market or they wanted like let, let's okay let's say that you think that in china that they're going to start making like 800 percent more microchips but you don't know which company is going to make more microchips and you don't really know how that's going to trickle down to the tech companies or how that's going to trickle down the, to, uh, to the consumers so you just want exposure to china tech and semiconductors that's the type of opportunities that we were offering to our hedge fund clients was so like the, the word derivative just means like you're not getting exposed to the direct thing. You're getting exposed to something that mirrors sort of the performance of it. And so um, usually the volatility of that, the ups and downs of that are a little less um, rapid. Got it. And so, so how many years do you do that for? I did that for about a year. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And I, I knew I didn't want to do it. I mean, pe- people there always at, at Goldman, there's this like, I don't, I don't want to call it silly, but there's this mantra that people always tell you early. It's like, what you, how you want to feel is you want to feel like you want to do your boss's job. I never felt that way. And by the way, I ended up moving into my boss's apartment, becoming best friends with him. He went from being a VP to being a managing director to being a partner to running the whole desk and the whole floor. We're super close. I love him as an individual. His name's Phil Hahn. Big, big shout out to Phil. Um, I never wanted to do that job. And that was clear in t- 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, okay. I moved on to, I moved on to investment banking at Goldman and I did that. So for you, a couple sw- years. 
Okay, so you switched from equity derivatives to investment banking. And is that, did you learn how to financial model and all that kind of stuff there? I sucked at it. I was really bad. I was like sure. legendarily bad. Really? Uh, it's because your Microsoft Excel, uh, you know, abilities, like what? I think I was mostly working with natural resources companies. So I was working with like large chemical and like petroleum companies. And I just didn't care about what they did. And it really took me out of like the work. I learned how to model um, well enough. I learned how to build like a great PowerPoint, but I just, I lacked focus um, because I just didn't give a shit. And I also, for better or worse, I actually brought my best friend from equity derivatives. I made her transfer to investment banking with me. She's, she's still there and she's got a big senior job now and she's spectacular. Um, but that like, I don't know, you just have to care. And also like some people know this, some people don't, but like investment banking is really just a sales job. Like for a junior person, it's an analytical job, but for a senior person, all you really, really want to do is go to like really big company A and convince them to buy really big company B or go to really big company A and convince them that they need to do like a $500 million financing and take a big new investment. Um, so it's just a sales job. You just want to be able to sell them your service of being able to help them buy that company or get more money or whatever it is. That was interesting. That yes. Those relationships seem compelling, but like the day-to-day of talking about like, I, and this is exactly what I talked about, like how the rubber on tires is applicated to like affirm a certain amount of like grip percentage per square inch. Fuck that. Just no one cares. Um, okay, got so it. Was, so I, so I, you, I you saw the bigger, the bigger picture. You wanted to be that guy who was, you know, talking the strategic versus doing like how you allocate that rubber and that amortization and depreciation schedule. Right. Um, ex- that's exactly right. And like, right. Even I think that you find out, I think you you may know this better than most, but like every job is just a sales job. Every job is just a sales job. You're selling something to somebody. And so it it just depends on what that thing is. If it's a product or service, how complicated that product or service is, how, like how big, you know, is it a teeny tiny decision and you're spending a hundred dollars or is it a gigantic thing that you're selling that costs a hundred million dollars? Every job is a sales job. And so I just, I, I felt like I needed to find that seat where it was, I wanted the highest level, most complicated sales job that existed. Um, okay. So, so what we went towards. But, well, so you were at Goldman in the banking position for two years? About two years. And then did you leave it? I left and I couldn't get the jobs I wanted and I like, could barely get the interviews I wanted. And so I what took, were you Were you looking to go to like venture capital? What were you looking to do? I wanted to do media private equity. So I wanted to invest like large scale, 50 million to $250 million checks into media businesses, but no one wanted the kid that, that had chemical experience. So I, I ended up taking a job in midtown Manhattan at a, at a firm called Jeggy, J E G I, I know where it was a complete investment banking chop shop. So I went from a firm of 30,000 people to a firm of 30 investment professionals. I went from having, you know, all of the infrastructure in the entire world from like simple shit, like, a healthcare plan that function to, you know, when, if you're a Goldman and you have a presentation and like a graph isn't like rendering correctly and like the colors are wrong, you can send it to a team called presentation services in India. And overnight someone fixes the whole thing and sends it back to you. Perfect. Like there's none of that. I, I went from that to, I had to buy my own books. Like when I had to take presentations to meeting, I was printing them out page by page and punching holes in them and then putting the little like, spirally binders onto the clips in the middle of the night. And so, um, honestly, it's what taught me how to work like that. That's the experience of all the experiences that taught me, like, how long were you at Jackie for? No one else is. How long were you there for a year to the day? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have left. I was making bank and it was kind of an eat what you kill model. So if, if you closed a deal and you help someone sell their company or buy something, whatever, you got a big fat bonus. And I helped a woman um, named Nancy Splain, who ran a business called Connecting Point Marketing Group, sell her business. Um, and she ended up being like my reference and how I got my job at Time Warner. And I wouldn't have left. Like if that exact job hadn't come up and it basically came through her um, at Time Warner to go work in the venture capital space there, I would have stayed. And I, I don't know if I'd still be there, but 
Um, I was making great money. I was working my ass off. I was traveling three, four days a week. And I just, I found like something I was good at in the right way. Yeah, I know Jackie. Robert Bernstein, you know, that's the guy there. And then there was a, a lady in charge, I think. Um, so that was like, what, 2016? Yep, for about a year. Okay. And then you went to Time Warner Venture Capital. Yeah, so we um, tried to tried to build a, a VC firm within Time Warner that would really be returns driven and, and optimized for making money. Um, I hope this is interesting. We can just skip all this shit if you want. No, to I want to know. Uh, a Time okay. Warner, you're trying to build a venture capital firm um, inside Time Warner. And I think that's very interesting because, like, did you guys pull that just off? Checking. Just yeah, checking. Go. Um, no, please. So we, we started this process, you know, getting, you know, senior buy-in and, you know, the right, you know, executives on board. And then AT&T bought Time Warner and turned Time Warner into Warner Media. And so while we had this little group and we had money to invest and we had office space and I had like a sick job title. I was like the director of venture capital and business development for time Warner. Yes. Like I was really young for that job. And like, people really were like, Holy shit. How did Marshall get that job? Um, it was a lot less sexy under the hood. at t ended up, I think this is true. Firing 17,000 out of the 30,000 employees of time Warner as they transitioned into Warner media. And so, I very fortunately kept my job and that was luck more than anything else. I, I had built this um, sports betting presentation for this, uh, this little group called the Technology Advisory Council, which was John Stanky, the CEO of at t Mary Meeker, who ran Kleiner Perkins and Mark yep. Cuban. Um, and I built this presentation and the guy, I'm not going to tell the story the right way, but Basically, the guy that was supposed to give the presentation also left the firm as a part of the layoffs. So I ended up getting to, you know, I was able to take credit for the presentation when I, like, otherwise would have just made the pages and been in the background. Yep, yep, yep. So it's timing. Extremely, extreme timing. And Mary Meeker, who is, like, probably in the top 10 most legendary venture capitalists of all time, sent an email to John Stanky and said, hey, like, great sports betting presentation. That guy Marshall seems pretty young, but he seems sharp. Like, one line. Mary Meeker and said I, that. I, what's that? Mary Beaker said that. I, I've, I've actually, I've had the chance to thank her. I don't even know if she would remember, but she, you, should, she you, should, you should have, you should have that email printed out and framed on your wall. Um, and over the following weeks, my entire team was let go except for me, and so I ended up with this job as like the head of this little group for over a year sitting on a floor at the Warner Media building in Hudson but, Yards completely by myself. Like, but this, this but, but this had nothing to do with the sports, but the sports betting thing was just, you know, you a did random a report. side project, like a random, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a little bit younger. Do you mind you know, doing the, doing the shit yep, work? Yep. Actually yep. doing the presentation. Yep. Okay. And so, so you did that. Then you're in the um, time, like you're in the, whatever the place Hudson Yards by yourself. And this is like, how many years are you at time Warner so far? By the time I was there by myself, I was like two and a half years and almost three years. Ago. Okay. So now you're there by yourself. And then what? I, I knew this wasn't going to last. Yeah. I knew it wasn't going to, I mean, it was like, the, I mean, it wasn't the writing on the wall. This was like Harry Potter and the chamber of secrets. Like there was blood dripping down the walls at, at in Hudson yards. Okay. And so I started to think about like what my plan might look like for leaving. Um, and I talked to all sorts of people, right? Like I, it wasn't that I was definitely going to go run a venture capital firm. Um, definitely not. I talked to the NFL. I talked to, I talked to the XFL. I talked to the WWE about running, helping run um, Dana White's family office at the UFC. I talked to everybody and I kind of landed on this plan um, that I was going to leave primarily without a job that like none of these things really fit me and they weren't entrepreneurial enough because you know, what you find out very quickly is if you're not investing your own money or investing you know, truly on behalf of investors, you're not going to make enough money. Like you're going to be taking all this risk. Your head's going to be on the chopping block every day. If you're going to take all that risk, you, the, better, the return profile better be there. So um, I quit my job with this concept. It was not called Animal Capital. I did not know any celebrities. I did not know Josh, Griffin, Noah. I didn't know Michael Gruen. I didn't know Ashton Kutcher. I didn't know any of these people. But I quit with this concept of like, could I, could I work with celebrities on, you know, on the investment side and help them, you know, whether it's individually or as a part of a broader collective, could I help them optimize their investments 
in a way where they write a check and then they're able to do some marketing work for these businesses and then really explode and like create like outsized returns for the, you know, the impact that they're making. Um, and so I left my job without a plan. I mean, without like a clear plan, I had a sense clearly. Did you know, did you know any of those guys yet? Like, did you know Josh Griffin or I, I, I didn't know they existed. I, I oh. reached before I met them. I re, I reached out to 3000 people, 3000 people, all individual notes. And by the way, so say I left fall of 19. Um, and then COVID hit in March. And I, you know, I, I was like, for me, I was lucky, right? Like I got to go home and, and my parents had a you know, fridge full of food and a car for me to drive. And I was very fortunate and other people you know, weren't, weren't so lucky. And so I, I started getting this like hit rate on people responding to my DMs and my emails and my phone calls. So out of the 3000 people, I spoke to 90 of them. So like when you say 3000, like how did you like actually make like a Excel doc or Google doc and put these names in there? Like, give me some color names, on that email addresses, who I thought their manager was, how I reached out to them. And I wrote and Jason, I wrote individual notes. These were not, this was not copy paste bullshit. This was, this was not know, someone else we know. Okay. Yeah. No, comment. I'm joking. Someone else we know, like, you know, a guy, it's a guy that yeah, I, a random person, Yeah, um, random. I mean, I'm this guy, James sent Santangelo right there. That's who we're talking about. James, we we're just talking about you, how you did the copy and paste emails. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. And so I spoke to 90 of these people and one of the people that I spoke to r- randomly enough, their fiance had taken an investment from Ashton Kutcher and brought me up to Ashton and said, Hey, you know, I, you know, this kid kind of wants to do this thing with celebrities and investing and I mean, whatever. Because, because you had a, you had an amazing background for all this, man. Yeah, I, I had, I fit, you're right. I did. I had, I had done true media work. I'd done work with talent. I had done investing work and I had real financial chops, right? Like I had years of investment banking, both yep. with all the infrastructure in the world. And also I had was out there at the smaller bank doing it by myself. So like I, I did have the right pieces. Um, and so his, the fiance ends up putting me on FaceTime, I think with Griffin or Josh and Ashton. And I was sitting, I was actually sitting at the restaurant where I used to wash dishes um, during COVID. And he just kept calling me, the fiance did over and over. He'd pick up the phone, pick up the phone. And he's a crazy person. We've become very good friends. He's an awesome guy. His name's Ken. And I finally step away from dinner and I pick up FaceTime. And it's like Ashton, and I think it was Griffin and Josh and Michael Gruen, all on FaceTime. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And by the way, I have no idea who Josh and Griffin are. No clue. Um, very good looking kids, but I'm like, mm, I'm more looking at Ashton. Um, and they said, we want to start a fund. And I said, I want to start a fund. And I was like, I want to work with celebrities. And they're like, we are celebrities. And just to give you a sense of like timing for all of this, I'm Googling them while I'm on the phone, right? Like I scroll away from the FaceTime. I'm trying to figure out who I'm talking to. It was maybe five days after um, Mayor Garcetti, the mayor of LA, had shut off the water and electricity to their house in LA. And it was like the biggest story in the world was these kids were throwing like the biggest COVID ragers on earth. Right. Um, and so I'm like, but maybe this is my shot. And so I I, I, I got to know them um, and our plans fused at the right, you know, kind of at the right time. And um, animal capital as it, you know, as it's known today was sort of, sort of born there. Um, we spent the entire fall of, of 2020 taking, we took so many calls with founders that I burned out my vocal cords. We were taking like 12 to 16 calls a day and I couldn't speak by the end of the day that I had to go get an endoscopy and get, and get medicated because I almost broke my vocal cords. Wow. From just on uh, these calls. On Zoom all day, rolling 30 minute calls from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day. So you had this vision. You were at Time Warner investing. You're, you know, you had the background. You're at Goldman and you're like, I want to start a fund associated with celebrities and connections and using the, it's not the celebrities just like as for investors, but their connections, you know, to bring in stuff. And you, then COVID happened. So you're like, shit. Like COVID happened, I left my job, but then you go home and you're like, all right, I can just pull up, I can write these names down and I'm gonna go at it. I'm gonna write handwritten notes, which you are not handwritten, but emails, whatever. 
and you did that. And then that resulted into something. I, I talk about this all the time. I actually heard someone say this at a wedding and I just stole it, but it's like luck that's created through friction. Like I never knew that this was going to be the result. Right. I mean, I'm this October, we're now, I'm, I met, you know, I met these guys over four years ago now. It was, I guess that's not true. I guess it's been official animal capital is I left my job four years ago and I met and we, we started like, what is like current animal capital three years ago this week. And now animal capital where like, and I know we're getting long, but could you just name some of your investors like that people may be familiar with their names, even if they're small investment, just like some of the names. I just want people to hear um, this. We work with Mark Wahlberg, uh, James Corden, Christina Aguilera, Paris Hilton, Nick Braun, who plays cousin Greg in succession. Um, and then like a handful of NBA and NFL and uh, NHL folks. Um, we also work, we also have the, uh, 25 year president of, of Disney, CEO of TikTok, the founder of Netflix, the founder of Android, the founder of Twitch, the founder of Tinder. Well, these aren't just people that just invest and they're quiet. Like, I believe you communicate with a guy like James Corden, right? Like, you have those connections. So, if a company is out there raising money, and I mean, yes, if they're looking for dumb money, then go wherever. But if you're looking for strategic money where, you know, getting the brand out there, like, you have those relationships. I mean, Animal Capital has done this in such a short amount of time with like not a bunch of resources. I, we don't have a lot of resources. Um, we're working on that. Uh, no, I, I what mean, I mean, what what I what what I mean by that is you didn't go hire a big office staff. You didn't go hire like a you know marketing directors and all that. Like you you, you did it through grit. Like I'm a Detroit Lion guy. You did it through grit and hustle, and that's the best kind. And that's why. I think you're so successful and I want to go to a couple of your successful investments. One that has gotten a lot of press. Will you just talk, talk about it really quickly? Cause I know we're at the 30. What are we at Aaron Bree? I mean, Aaron Thomas. Well, he's probably, he's probably sleeping. So you tell me about the, the one that's gotten the most press and this is uh, a crazy investment. Um, we invested in a business called Colossal. I assume that's what you're talking about. Um, yes. Colossal is a synthetic biology platform founded by Ben Lamb, who exited, I think, four out of his first five businesses, primarily in marketing, marketing, tech, gaming, and then AI tech and defense. This is the most recent acquisition. Uh, wait till you sale. guys hear this one. Okay, so he exited at four out of five. Now wait till you hear what this one is. And these are marketing tech and stuff like that. Now, go ahead. Um, this is crazy. He is planning on uh, de-extincting the most recognizable species in the history of mankind that were driven off of earth by humans. So that includes the woolly mammoth, the thylacine, the dodo bird, um, the blue elk. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, we're, we're also planning on saving like the Northern white rhino and our, and our uh, partnered with the local government there. We're partnered with the government in Mauritius. We're partnered with the Australian government. We're partnered with the government in North Dakota. We've got, we really gotten deep here. And so we, we invested when it was an idea and it was 25 pages of a PowerPoint and a two hour phone call. Um, that was about three years ago. And today that business is worth a billion and a half dollars. Um, they've raised $225 million. We're pretty substantive stakeholders of that billion and a half dollars. And um, we're on our, we're on a path and we are on time for delivering our first animal. So um one of the one of the things people always ask me about the business, which I think is interesting, is from the time that you met Ben to now, how many times has he moved the timeline on when he's going to bring back an animal? And the answer is zero, not once. Um, so we're 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 right on track. So animal capital, what what's on the horizon? Um, if people are listening, and they want to get in touch with you. What like what kind of investments are you looking at? Um, um, and everything I, I'll look at it. The crazier the idea, the better. That is kind of the mantra. I say, if it's not making people's lives better or more fun, I'm not investing in it. And if, and I, we, we like crazy. I mean, the, the bets that we take are, you know, so early that you have to expect a lot of them are going to go to zero, not too many, but a handful of them are going to go to zero. But if we can take a, completely nuts idea and just put a couple little pieces of infrastructure around that idea and around that CEO and give them an opportunity to succeed. 
that's that's all we can do. I mean, so, let them run. Marshall, in a market where like you know M and A fundraising was so active two years ago, you know during COVID or whatever pre, and it slowed down so much. Do you just like do you get depressed? Do you get like like you're like helping the companies execute so they hit their numbers and they don't need to raise more? Like what do you do in in the, in when it's uh, when the mode is slower? Like I, the Wall Street Journal had an article about private equity is at its lowest point right now in terms of exits. Um, what what do you do? Yeah, I mean private equity private equity is in a different place, right? I mean their their entire business is around being able to lever their business and take out debt. And when, when debt is, you know, when the starting price of debt is 8%, it becomes a totally different business. Okay. Um, I am, I am punching myself in the face for not buying a house three years ago though. I think about that every, every morning I wake up and I look at home prices and I'm like, I could have afforded that, but today I cannot. Because of the uh, mortgage rates. Mm-hmm. Um, mo- I would say today and a lot more than you know, maybe two years ago, I would spend more time helping the founders like, like day to day, like what can we actually do on the ground for you? Um, and so like we're working with a business that I love called Vessel Health, um, which is a urine test strip diagnostic business. It's both B2C and B2B2C. And we ran like from end to end their first influencer campaign. We got the talent. We structured the deal. We made sure that the posts were going up. We made sure that like the boxes were showing up on time and they had the right discount code and like stuff like that's fun. Like it moves the needle for the business. It moves the needle for me. Um, it's a way for our, our celebrities to make money. And like, I, I don't, I don't mind the slower deal pace because it gives us time to focus on what's important, which are like, when you, when you write these checks, right, you spend eight to 12 weeks diligencing a deal. Yep. And then you're married to them for a decade married and you can't get divorced. There's no divorce papers. You're just, this is the business that you're in. And so getting to take time to like really acknowledge those relationships and build on them and like make them friendships is great. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so that's what that's the phase you're in. Now I don't know if he's still here. I think he may have disappeared on us. I know your close friend and then mutual friend. Um, oh, oh, he's here. Griffin, Griffin Johnson, are you here? Yes. Okay, I didn't even think he was there. Look at him. Look at this. Does he have? So Griffin, we got you here. We got Marshall here. You got a question for Marshall or a story you could share of his networking genius, like how he's done this shit. I know you rate talk about how Marshall's the fucking man. This is like this is Marshall's bar mitzvah right now. We're doing so. Um, I'm gonna jump out of the window. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So Griffin, please no no stories that start with well we were at the strip club. Anything? Nothing that starts there, if you don't mind. No, I, I I'm not here to take any light away. I. I actually wasn't even thinking of speaking. I just wanted to listen to like, sometimes things go by so quick. I forget how things start. So I was actually enjoying listening to Marshall's side of like how animal came to fruition. Um, I think if I had to ask Marshall a question, it would be a genuine question. Um, and I think I would ask him, what's the number one thing that he looks for in a founder because i think it's really important when you're i feel like animal we've invested in founders a lot even more so than like the product um at least from what i've seen most times it's really good people so i've always wondered like it doesn't have to be one i guess but what's the main thing you look for in a founder and no bullshit marshall i I won't um and and before you answer if lisa's here make sure she stays to the end we have a surprise so go ahead great also, also for uh, for whoever has 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 made it last has gotten this far through the podcast is this this is nice. Griffin's like a- actually my best friend and someone I talk to. I don't know three or four times a week, like most days. Um, and I don't know. It's like the, been the, the the best part of this whole thing is is having folks like Griffin that like spend time with me and my parents and whatever. But I need um, a soundboard for the uh, crying emo- the crying noise. Where is the soundboard, Aaron Thomas? Jesus. Um, but I would answer your question. I think that like, especially now when the market's garbage, the number one thing that I'm trying to figure out, like with, with Dylan that works with us, like that we like sit there and we actively talk about out loud because you're totally right. Right. Like it's not like most things we invest in aren't completely unique. Like there's going to be a competitor or there's going to be like, well, what happens when Pepsi buys the business or Amazon buys the business or Citrix buys the business, like whatever. 
it's really, can we figure out a time in that founder's life or is it now where when something goes completely wrong, like we trust them to make the right decisions to fix it and that they're not going to walk away from what they're doing. Because we like over the last you know, three years, we've only had four businesses close. Like we're in the top probably 0.5% in terms of per, fund performance. I'm knocking on wood here. Um, as well as uh, you know, lack of businesses closing. We've been you know, in a nice place there. And I hope that I'm not jinxing the shit out of ourselves here. But it's because our founders don't give up. Like our founders like will smack their head into the wall until the wall breaks and they find a new wall to, to break. And we've only, and of those four, one of the founders quit on us. And like, that's the thing I beat myself. Up. Like the other investments I'd probably like, we invested in a guy named um, named Hugh who ran a business called Ugly Drink, which is this non-alcoholic seltzer business. Another random fucking sparkling water business. It tasted great. We loved him. We loved the way he's running the business. We thought there's a great way for us to help this business. It's a shitty category. It's such a crowded space, but he worked so hard and he ended up winning like years before he should have. He ended up winning a contract with CVS to fulfill 2,500 CVSs across the country. And right when he signed on the dotted line, it was probably, I don't know, two weeks later, um, aluminum prices in China went up like 600%. And so the entire business went upside down in a heartbeat. And I don't blame him for that. I think that's what anyone would have done. I think anyone would have taken a, that that bet on themselves that they could fulfill that contract and change their business for forever. And I would not write that check. I would write that check again. I just- Wait, so I what trust- happened there? Is that the one that you stopped the business? That's a, that's a zero. That's a zero that's where zero. I, don't, that's zero. I would have made the same decision. There's another business and I don't want to call somebody out on a public forum, but it was a consumer product and he couldn't, couldn't cut it. And he had done it before. He had built startups yep. before and sold them. And for whatever reason, he just didn't have the, the wherewithal to, to, to see it through. And he raised a round from people much more impressive than me. He, he, he took money from um, a little bit of money from us and then a big check from Lara Hippo, which is like a, globally renowned venture capital and Lair. um and they he just bailed he was like i just can't do this um and it was a zero and like that 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 that's what i think about all the time because i think like how can we solve for that because if, if they're willing to get in the mud with us and by the way like griffin of all people has seen me do this over the last three years like things haven't always been shiny at colossal like we we have been through fundraising rounds where people didn't want to show up. People committed dollars or even signed the paperwork and then didn't fund, you know, didn't fund an investment and said like, "What are you going to do to me? Sue me?" And you know that they're not going to do that. And so we just you want when that moment happens. You I'm trying to find in that dating process that moment that like like are you going to be able to pick yourself up off the mat? Okay, now um, worst or first job. Worst or your worst or your first job? You may have already said it. The, yeah, first, the bus first boy. Job, first job's not interesting. My first job was I, I worked at a snack bar and I was a lifeguard. My worst job was I worked for a guy um, named Bob Dumas. And I, I printed, you can tag him. He um, was the uh, like shock jock radio guy in Raleigh at this radio station called G105. And he had the biggest morning radio show. Um, it was called Bob and the Showgram. And it ran for 20 years. And I interned there and they would treat the interns like shit and do crazy pranks and whatever. And he, um, I, I'm, I, I hope I don't, I'm going to try and say this the, the right politically correct way. He is both racist and homophobic. Um, and he made a handful of comments to me on the air that about, you know, about my sexuality. And I, I, I happen to be heterosexual, but like commenting on how I dressed and how it might appeal to guys and whatever, to the point where like I left in tears and quit. Um, and I thought it was gonna be like the most fun summer of my whole life. And it was a complete fucking disaster. And it was, it, it fell into that bucket of like, never meet your heroes. Cause like when you're really young, you like find that racy stuff to be like particularly fun and interesting and whatever. And then being in there and like having, like being the victim of bullying in that way. And I'm a pretty big anti-bullying advocate. And it's something that I've had to deal with for a really long time. Um, being the victim of it, like it sort of like shocked me. I think it's one of those formative events that sort of teaches you to be sensitive and empathetic to others things. And it was definitely the worst job I've ever had. No, that's a very interesting story. Okay. Marshall Salmon, we had you for an hour. We had, uh, we, we had Lisa up here just in the messages, Griffin Johnson. We've gotten your, a lot of your life story. There's so much more animal capital. Check them out. Check it out. Um, 
and look at these investments. Google it. I mean, the guy, the guy has made it happen. And he, how has he made it happen? By having grit, tenacity, and not having fear. I mean, going from the that career, and what's interesting is Time Warner laid off all these people, lone man standing. There's a reason why, because maybe in the man behind the scenes, but he made it happen. And I thought one of the coolest things, the uh, Mary Meeker, the that the, I know who Mary Meeker is. I know where she is now, but I, when I was in college, I followed her like her her reports, her internet reports. I printed those things out, studied them, and yeah. Anyways, that is pretty freaking sweet. So, thank you for coming on, um, and appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jason. All right, we'll have you on in a future Raz report. <laughs>